This is a walk through the history of microbiology. So what was life like in a time before microbiology? Illness and disease were thought to have a supernatural cause. Many people thought it was due to the wrath of God or evil spirits. The possibility of illness and disease being linked to unseen organisms was postulated, but not widely believed, until the invention of the microscope and a series of experiments that did not occur until the 17th century. The miasmatic theory. Galen of Pergamon, 200 AD, was actually a pioneer in the fields of medicine, anatomy, and philosophy. Galen created what is called the miasmatic theory that postulates that disease is caused by bad air, also known as malaria, and also miasmatic odors or bad odors. It was thought that these miasmatic odors, or bad air, arose from decaying organic matter, and that that was the cause of diseases such as cholera, chlamydia, and bubonic plague. Although incorrect, the miasmatic theory did spur the development of better sanitation and better hygiene practices. Aqueducts were built that brought in fresh water. Sewers were built that carried away waste and sewage. This practice did protect the Romans from many waterborne diseases. Hippocrates in 460 to 370 BC was a Greek philosopher. He is considered the father of Western medicine. Hippocrates believed that illness and disease were caused by an imbalance among the four vital humors within us. The humors were liquid-like substances. The idea was if a person had either too much or too little of one of these four humors or liquid-like substances, then the result would be illness or disease. The four vital humors, according to Hippocrates, was yellow bile, black bile, phlegm, and blood. Hippocrates also authored many of the oldest known medical books and is said to have written the Hippocratic Oath or the Physician's Oath. The Hippocratic Oath, also known as the Physician's Oath. It is the oath that each physician takes before becoming a medical practitioner. It is an oath to uphold ethical standards, to refrain from judgment or bias, and to do no harm. Before cell theory, there was the theory of spontaneous generation. The theory of spontaneous generation was an idea actually so universal that its origin or where it came from is still unknown. The idea of the theory of spontaneous generation is that a living organism could, could be brought about from a non-living entity or a non-living thing. It was thought that life was able to arise from non-living matter if that non-living matter contained a supernatural substance that he referred to as the pneuma or vital heat. The Greek word pneuma means breath or spirit. As odd as the idea of spontaneous generation may seem today, we need to remember that they only knew what they knew. They made observations and came to conclusions based on those observations. And not only was this idea somewhat universal, but it actually took uh, centuries, if not millennia, to convince even some of the most creative, brilliant scientific minds of the fallacy or untrue nature of the theory of spontaneous generation. So what were these uh, supposed observations that allowed such a incorrect theory to persist for such a long period of time? Well, many people have said uh, seeing is believing. So the observations that led to the theory of spontaneous generation, fleas may appear out of dust particles, um, fish may seem to just appear out of a new puddle of water, 
Mice might seem to just suddenly appear in a pile of corn husks or grain. Maggots may seem to magically appear in rotting meat. Worms might appear from a dead animal. Um, flies might appear out of a pile of manure. The list can go on and on. Francisco Reddy was an Italian physician, and he performed an experiment demonstrating that maggots do not spontaneously generate on rotting meat. In the 1600s, two scientists on opposite sides of the theory of spontaneous generation, uh, one believer and one non-believer, battle it out in the lab. Uh, Francisco Reddy was a non-believer. However, there were the majority of scientists as well as lay people believed in spontaneous generation. Antoni van Leeuwenhoek, who, as we will see a little bit later, contributed greatly to the history of microbiology in a lot of other aspects, was actually a great proponent for spontaneous generations. So what Reddy did is he performed a simple experiment using jars containing rotting meat. I covered the jars with gauze to prevent flies from coming into direct contact with the meat, while the other jar was just left open. Okay, So here's uh, just an illustration of the setup of Reddy's experiment. So one of the ideas of spontaneous generation was this pneuma, or vital force, which was believed to be that spiritual force that led to the spontaneous generation. The pneuma was believed to travel through the air. This is why the jars were covered with gauze and not simply closed with their So let's look at the possible outcomes. If spontaneous generation was correct, both samples of meat should produce maggots because they are both exposed to the air, so the pneuma or vital heat should be able to cause spontaneous generation. If spontaneous generation was incorrect, the meat inside the covered jar will not produce maggots. In other words, it has nothing to do with pneuma or vital heat. It's the flies that are causing those maggots to appear. Possible outcome three would be if maggots appear in meat only after there has been direct contact with flies, then the meat in the uncovered jar will produce maggots, and the meat in the covered jar will not produce maggots. So what was the outcome? Conclusions. The conclusions of Reddy's experiments was that spontaneous generation is not correct. Another conclusion from Reddy's experiments was that the maggots appeared in meat after coming into direct contact with flies, giving evidence to the hypothesis that maggots may come from flies. So this was the first evidence against spontaneous generation. And a huge step forward in microbiology was the invention of the microscope. So the discovery of cells and the development of cell theory due to the invention of high-powered microscopes in the 17th century. The first microscopes were very simple and very had very limited magnifying power. Um, there is some debate surrounding who invented the first microscope, but there is evidence of early microscopes uh, being invented even as early as the first century. But they probably were not very useful when it came to observing cells. Zacharias Janssen and the first compound microscope. Zacharias and Hans Janssen were able to combine magnifying lenses together that resulted in an image that was nine times larger than what could be seen with the naked eye. So with the discovery and invention of the compound microscope, we were able to finally start to look at the microscopic world around us. English scientist Robert Hooke discovered cells while looking at a thin slice of cork. Um, and if you don't know what cork is, cork is actually um, dead plant cells. So he described the cells as cells, use the term cells, because they resembled uh, tiny boxes. Um, and looked somewhat like the tiny boxes of a honeycomb. So here we actually see a, an illustration from his 1665, from Robert Hooke's 
1665 book Micrographia. And uh, this is actually an illustration of the sample of cork that he observed as the first cells observed under a microscope. In 1675, Anton van Leeuwenhoek was actually given the honorary title of the father of microbiology. He's probably best known for his discovery of microorganisms. Anton van Leeuwenhoek was coined the father of microbiology because he observed the first motile, motile meaning mobile or able to uh, move around. Okay, so the first motile microscopic life forms. And he called them animacules. He gathered his animacules from a drop of pond water that he had collected. He also discovered the first bacteria. Cells had already been discovered by Hook, but those were plant cells. Animal cells and bacteria cells were discovered by Lewin Hook. Before this time, microorganisms were hypothesized but never actually observed. Many people were resistant to the idea that something could exist that was actually too small to be seen with the naked eye. It was not until the invention of the microscope that this micro world was able to be seen. Early microscopes did not have much magnifying power. Until 1675, when Antony van Leeuwenhoek developed the first microscopic lenses, powerful enough to view these small microbes, the first improvements resulted in a magnification of up to 300x. Louis Pasteur did so much amazing work in his lifetime. So Louis Pasteur performed a series of experiments um, that presented overwhelming evidence against the theory of spontaneous generation. Many consider Lewis Pasteur's experiments to be the death blow to the theory of spontaneous generation. Lewis Pasteur postulated that microbes grew in broth because broth was exposed to microbes in the air. These microbes would get into the broth from the air and grow. The other idea was in line with the theory of spontaneous generation. This idea was that the microbial growth in the broth was due to this pneuma, or the vital force, which was that spiritual force in the air causing spontaneous generation of these microorganisms to spontaneously generate out of the broth. In order to put these ideas to the test, Pasteur designed a special swan-necked flask that was designed to allow air through, or the pneuma through, or the vital heat through. However, it would actually trap any microorganisms uh, just due to gravity. So here's a diagram of the experiment. Um, so broth is a nutrient medium that has nutrients that microbes need to live. And they had already developed that and had been using that in scientific experiments. And they also knew that in order to purify the broth, they would have to heat it. And so we see it being heated or boiled over a Bunsen burner to purify or sterilize the broth at the beginning of the experiment. At the beginning of the experiment, take the broth, boil it so it's sterilized, and um, that way there's no contamination. So this is sterilized and it's in this, uh, this swan necked flask. You can see here it is protected from microorganisms. Okay. This swan neck portion of the flask will allow any air or pneuma or vital heat to come through, but it will trap any dust particles, contaminants, uh, microorganisms in this uh, area here. So then you incubate for a few days. And they found in this case, no microbes. There were no microorganisms. The vital heat was able to get through, but no microbes. So when they repeated the experiment, but broke off the swan neck of the swan neck flask, um, the organisms that you couldn't see that um, were hypothesized that were just in the air, now had access to the broth. Wait a little while and lo and behold, microorganisms were in the broth. 
So it had been observed already that microbes would grow in nutrient-rich broth, but there was a debate as to why or how this occurred. It was also known that boiling broth would kill microbes. For this reason, broth was boiled to destroy any existing microbes in the broth at the beginning of the experiment. After boiling, several experiments involving broth inside of the swan-necked flasks were performed. Broth that was sterilized and incubated in intact swan-necked flasks were exposed to air only and were protected from dust particles and microbes in the air. The broth in intact flasks did not produce microbes, despite having access to air, which would have the vital heat or pneuma. It was found that the swan neck flask, the swan neck portion of the swan neck flask, if that was broken off, the broth was exposed to the theoretical microbes that were in the air, and the broth would show microbial growth. Past year's experiments gave overwhelming evidence that microbial growth in broth was due to microorganisms coming in to the broth from the air and not due to vital heat or pneuma, basically disproving the theory of spontaneous generation. The first vaccine was developed in 1796 by Edward Jenner. The first vaccine was developed against smallpox. This occurred because Edward Jenner made the observation that milkmaids who had previously been infected with a very similar disease, a less severe disease called cowpox, were actually showing protection from getting smallpox. The principle behind vaccinations is that a disease can be prevented if you expose the subject to a milder form of the disease-causing agent. Also, interestingly, the term vaccine comes from the term variola vaccine, which means smallpox of the cow. Initially, the terms vaccine and vaccination were used exclusively for smallpox, but in 1881, Lewis Pasteur proposed that the definitions of these terms, vaccine and vaccination, be broadened to include all of the newly created vaccines in honor of Edward Jenner. Disease Transmission in the 1700s and earlier, it was thought that diseases were spread by miasma or bad air. This was the miasmatic theory. Miasma was thought to be a foul-smelling, uh, rotting particles in the air that could cause disease. As more scientific information became available, New outbreaks of disease led to new scientific inquiries, which gave rise to the field of epidemiology. John Snow is known as the father of epidemiology. In the mid-1800s, this British physician, John Snow, conducted what is known to be the first epidemiological study. He sought to discover the source of a cholera outbreak in London. Snow successfully traced the origins of the outbreaks to water sources that were found to be contaminated with sewage. John Snow showed that diseases are not only transmitted through the air, but can also be transmitted through contaminated items such as water. So epidemiology is the study of the source, the cause, and the mode of transmission of a disease. John Snow has received the honorary title of the father of epidemiology and is known to be the first person to have conducted an epidemiological study.
This is actually the original map by John Snow showing the clusters of cholera cases in London in the mid-1850s. The golden age of microbiology began also around 1850 with Ignace Philip Samoweis. Philip Samoweis was instrumental in the development of aseptic techniques as a defense against germs, causes of disease according to germ theory. And germ theory is basically saying that germs are the cause of disease. That the so Samoweis was instrumental in the development of aseptic techniques to defend against these so-called germs. Um, Semmelweis discovered that hand washing and obstetrical clinics drastically reduced the incidence of what was called a childhood fever. Now, Semmelweis's discovery was tested and proved over and over again. However, the scientists of the day um, and physicians of the day were reluctant to accept that hand washing, something as as um, trivial, as they thought, as hand washing could actually reduce mortality rates. And also because the idea of miasmatic theory was prevalent and widely still accepted within the medical and scientific communities. In fact, many medical practitioners refused to wash their hands and were even insulted and offended um, at the idea that their hands were dirty or contaminated. Uh, they thought it was preposterous. Samwise um, was given the honorary name of the savior of mothers. So um, this uh, fever was common in the 1850s and often fa fatal. Um, aseptic techniques created um, that he created involved disinfecting the hands with a chlorinated lime solution. And he published his findings in, uh, in a book he titled Etiology, um, Etiology, Concept and Prophylaxis of Childbed Fever. Non-sterile environments were still commonplace um, in the medical community, resulting in extraordinarily high mortality rates of approximately 50% among patients who had undergone various surgical procedures. Semmelweis demonstrated that non-sterile environments that the patients endured during surgeries led to these post-operative infections that caused these high mortality rates. Semmelweis concluded that these infections were due to unseen microbes that were able to travel through the air or to travel from person to person through direct contact or from object to person causing illness and death. These infections were in fact so common, they were termed ward fever. Unfortunately, Semmelweis's ideas were not popularized until after his death, when Lister and Louis Pasteur continued his work in antisepsis. Louis Pasteur was one of the proponents of the germ theory, stating that germs are the cause of infectious diseases and is often miscredited as its creator. Also, Louis Pasteur created pasteurization and was able to define that fermentation was uh, coming from a single-celled organism called the yeast. Samwise's ideas were finally popularized after his death, due in part to a series of experiments performed by Louis Pasteur. These exper experiments performed by Louis Pasteur confirmed the germ theory and Joseph Lister, who practiced and operated using hygienic methods with great success. Lewis Pasteur invented a process that reduced the number of pathogens in certain food products. This process was named pasteurization and is where we get products today like pasteurized milk. The process of pasteurization kills most of the bacteria that causes spoilage, thereby increasing the quality of the food and protecting public health. Louis Pasteur also proved that the fermentation process was caused by the single-celled organisms called yeast. Of course, the fermentation process had been around for millennia, but they didn't know 
what organism was responsible for the fermentation process. In 1885, Pasteur also developed a vaccine for rabies and laid the foundation for an entire new field that would become known as bacteriology, which is the study of bacterial organisms. Joseph Lister helped to further the work of Ignace Simoise, who had developed the practice of sterile techniques and demonstrated the link between non-sterile environment and disease. In 1865, Joseph Lister developed the practice of antisepsis, which is the chemical disinfection of external living surfaces. The medical and scientific communities were more accepting of Samuel at this time, largely due to the overwhelming evidence produced by many scientists and physicians at the time, including work done by Louis Pasteur that provided overwhelming evidence in support of germ theory. The medical field adopted many of the aseptic techniques set forth by Lister. These methods of sterilization and decontamination became the new standard for patient care. A great many of the aseptic techniques developed by Joseph Lister are still in use in the medical field and laboratory field today. Listerine was developed in 1879 by Joseph Lawrence and was named after Joseph Lister in honor of Joseph Lister's contribution to antiseptic surgery. Robert Koch is known as the founder of bacteriology. Koch identified the pathogens that caused tuberculosis, cholera, and anthrax. Koch experimentally identified four generalized principles linking pathogens to disease. These principles were coined Koch's postulates and still hold true today. Robert Koch was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1905 for his research on tuberculosis. So here are Koch's postulates. Koch's postulates are basically a set of criteria to determine if a bacteria is the cause of a specific disease. Number one, the organism must always be present in every case of the disease. Number two, the organism must be isolated from a host containing the disease and grown in pure culture. Number three, samples of the organism taken from pure culture must cause the same disease when inoculated into a healthy, susceptible animal in the laboratory. Number four, the organism must be isolated from the inoculated animal and must be identified as the same original organism from the first originally diseased host. The history of virology. Virology is the scientific study of viruses and viral infection. Virology is a new science that began in the late 19th century with studies performed by Dmitry Ivanovsky and Martinus Bajernik. Before this time, viruses had not yet been discovered or classified. Even though Louis Pasteur and Edward Jenner had developed vaccines against some of the diseases caused by viruses, viruses themselves were still unknown. At this point in time, many of the viral infections were thought to be caused by bacterial agents. The hunt was on to find disease-causing agents. The isolation of bacteria involved a process called filtering. Viruses are about 10 times smaller than bacteria cells. So scientists knew that the disease-causing agent was smaller than the bacteria cells that they were collecting using the filters of the day. The challenge was then to make a filter that had pores that were tiny enough to trap these extraordinarily tiny disease-causing particles or organisms. These tiny disease-causing particles 
were later to be identified as viruses. In order to accomplish this task, Pasteur and Chamberlain created a new filter that they conveniently called the Pasteur-Chamberlain filter. This filter was able to trap viruses. In 1892, Dmitry Ivanovsky filtered the sap from a diseased tobacco plant and discovered that the filtrate was able to infect a healthy tobacco plant with the same disease. Independently, Martinus Bajernik discovered the same virus while conducting similar experiments in 1899. Bajernik described the filtrate as a contagious living liquid that acted like a poison or virus. The word virus comes from the word poison. This is how viruses got their name and the field of virology was born. Soon after, new specialized fields of study began, including mycology, which is the study of fungi, protozoology, which is the study of parasitic protozoas, the micro microbial ecology, which is the study of ecological roles of microorganisms, and many, many more. Using microorganisms as models for biological research ushered in a second golden age of microbiology. The second golden age of microbiology arguably began in the 1940s and was ushered in by genetic research performed by Salvador Luria and Max Dubruck. Luria and Dubruck successfully used the bacterium E. coli as a model to study gene expression and mutations. These types of studies go on all the time in laboratories today. This crucial time in history yielded a wealth of scientific, biological, and medical knowledge that undoubtedly brought about major advances in these fields within a relatively short period of time. In 1944, Oswald Avery, Colin McLeod, and and Macklin McCarthy were the first to identify DNA as the genetic material found in cells. This important discovery was made using the bacterium Streptococcus pneumonia. This discovery was later confirmed in 1953 by experiments preferred by Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase, in which viruses were used to infect bacteria cells.